Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure today to invite you to the online workshop in the frame of the RUCAPS project. RUCAPS is a, a, a European project, in a Marie Curie project, and uh, it's, uh, it's, um, the, 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 the title of the project is Enhancing and Implementing Knowledge-Based ICT Solutions Within High Risk and Uncertain Conditions for Agricultural Production Systems. This cycle of seminars is uh, for the fourth year meeting that, of course, was uh, uh, now is, uh, is not uh, as a physical workshop, but uh, it's an online workshop. So today, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Francesco Cellini, who is the head of the research center in uh, Metapontum Agrobios for us in Asia. And, uh, and uh, he, he will talk uh, about um, uh, plant phenotyping and how plant phenotyping can cope to, um, to an, a, a changing environment, a changing climate. So I leave the floor to, to Francesco. And um, you, if you want to, to, to make some questions, we can, you can also write them in the chat and we can and right, we can ask Francesco for the question to re reply to the questions at the end of the session. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Rina. I'm glad to be here with, uh, with all these uh, people to present some highlights in plant phenotyping. But uh, now I have to share my screen, so some, some, some seconds. Share the screen. So I hope all of you can see the, the screen now. And uh, yeah, just very, very brief uh, introduction to the, to the seminar. The seminar will be divided in six sections. The first will be on introducing a little bit myself and uh, the agency I work for, Alcia. The second will be on the importance of plants, the phenotype and the phenom concepts. The third part will be in center about the plant phenomics, what it's about, and uh, all the sensor and technologies that are used in this field of, 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 of science. And the fourth will be on H high throughput plant phenotyping, how it is used in plant drought responses, and we'll make also some examples on digital traits. And then I will go to the end with comparing genotypes or treatment effects and we'll uh, go to the conclusions. Um, let me introduce myself first. I am a biologist by degree. My name is Francesco Cellini, by the way, and I'm a biologist by degree and the plant biotechnologist by research background. And currently I cover the position of head of Metapontum Agrobio Research Center which belongs to the Basilicata Agency for Innovation and Development in Agriculture, whose acronym is ALSIA. The research center is located here, you can see part of Italy in the south, it's located in Metaponto, which is the cradle of the colonies of Magna Grecia, very close to the Ionian coast in Basilicata region in the, in the south. And Metaponto is also located in the province of Matera, which is a wonderful and unique city home of the Sassi and also UNESCO heritage site and European capital of culture in 2019. And uh, Alcia is, uh, was established in 1997. It's a public institution which is instrumental to the local government and operates primarily to promote the modernization, the innovation transfer and the development of agriculture and agrofood sector in Basilicata. Uh, the activities are organized in the territory uh, under the direction of the Matera headquarter, a provincial office in Potenza, the research and development center, which I'm head of, and several experimental and demo farms, which are spread in the territory and two extension units. And since January 2003, ALSI acquired the Agrobius Research Center, which is focused specifically on plant biotechnology and research services small and medium enterprises in industry in the bioeconomy sector. And uh, these are the main roles and activities that are also running, by the way. What, one is research development and innovation transfer to the agri-food sector. 
Then ASIA provides also agricultural extension services, so dissemination of information, innovation, technical and organizational consultancy. And then we also provide farming training and vocational training to farmers. And we also have agrotechnical services and support. And last but not least, we manage also important assets of the rural reform, which is a public asset, very important here in the city of And now I want to convince you about the importance of plants. If you want to talk about the phenotype, we have to be aware of the importance of the plants for our daily life and for the, for the planet. So that's why I invite you to see, to watch briefly. Oops, sorry. Escape. I went to this. Okay. And the shade is, is not work. So plants are, 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 are very important. And there is no doubt, uh, uh, in my opinion, that plants are important for our life. They give us food, fibers, drugs, providing relevant ecological services, such as carbon storage and solidity to cite some of the most important ones. And plants are the source of, of the air we breathe and most of the food we eat. Yet, we often don't think about keeping them healthy. This can have devastating results, as you, as you probably are aware of. FAO estimates that up to 40% of food crops are lost due to plant pests and disease annually. 2020, this year, has been declared by FAO Year of Plant Health. In the year of COVID, we do not have to forget that protecting plant health is protecting human health as well. Plant health is increasingly, is increasingly under threat. Climate change, human activities have altered ecosystems, reducing biodiversity and creating new niches where pests and uh, other, other stresses can trip in. Protecting plants from pests and diseases and abiotic stresses is far more cost effective than dealing with the full blown plant emergencies. So, prevention is critical to avoiding the devastating impact of diseases on agriculture. And science and our role have a specific role to play in this, in this area. So, developing crops that are more resilient to stresses is fundamental to meet future global challenges. Well, let's now dig in into the phenotype. So if you think about yield, yield stability, or disease resistance, or drought tolerance, or antioxidant content, nutritional values of our food, well, you can think of them as desired features that are part of what, what biologists call phenotype. So what, what is phenotype? A phenotype is the translation of the genetic program which is written into the genome under the interaction with the environment and external stimuli into the physical, chemical, and physiological properties. In a more rigorous scientific term, an organism phenotype is the complex of morphological and functional features that can be observed, measured. These are two important aspects. That's what we call traits in a plant. So the phenotype is a trait, but the phenome represents all the traits which are present in an organism. So the omic designation suffix defines a holistic approach. We would like to look at all the phenotypes that are present into the plants instead of looking at a single phenotype. Now we can certainly say that in our everyday life, when we eat food derived from plants, we eat a phenotype. When we use fibers or biopolymers derived from plants, we use part of a phenotype. When we extract substances from plants for drugs or cosmetics, for food additive, for example, we extract part of a phenotype. So if we wish to improve plant traits for stress tolerance, to provide resilience to, into the agronomic systems, we certainly need plant phenotyping. 
we need phenotyping in science to apply breeding and, and to study how gene function to identify heritable, heritable traits. We need phenotyping to characterize plant bio, plant uh, at farm level in order to better manage plant inputs. Like we need also phenotyping to characterize plant biodiversity and study climate change effects on plants. So plant phenotyping lies at the very heart of the agro developments to meet global challenge. One of the important features of the plants which make them different from the animal kingdom is that they have what we call phenotyping plasticity. So wild animals can escape from treats or from stresses just by walking on, or escaping using their legs, plants cannot do that. Plants stay in the same place and they have to adapt in the same place to the changing environment. So that's what we call plasticity. As you see, these are two nice examples. In the upper row, you see the same plant, the same genotypes in three different environmental conditions. They look different. You can never think that they're the same plant, but in indeed they are the same genotype. In a second example, which is more striking, this happens in the same day, you have that the plant is different. So you have the plant in the left at the 6 a.m. at low temperature, and on the right, you have the same corn plant at 2 p.m. when the temperature is very high. And now you have a different phenotype, and the two are not so similar, as you can see. So the difference is, of course, the temperature, and the leaf has a temperature difference of 25 degrees. So plants adapt themselves during, during the day, but plants also adapt themselves in several environments. This is quite important. So if we want to study phenotype, we do want to study phenotype across genotypes, but also across environment condition, but also along the days in different climatic conditions. So this is a challenge for who studies plant phenotypes. But we have some hurdles, we have some problems in phenotype analysis. So plant scientists know this very well. Phenotyping is most of the time was manual, is labor intensive, and related to that is high expensive. So there are costs associated to phenotyping. So it's a tedious process, is manual, is very complex. And never, uh, furthermore, we have also some hidden parameters that are difficult to detect. So we have to sample plants and we have to apply destructive measurements just by taking samples from plants. This disturbs, of course, the plant and we have then to apply statistics. As many of the measurements are local, it means that you have to go to the field and do that. And third and last, but very important, there is an operator bias that may make to introduce many errors to that. So measurements depends on the operator. So this is what we call the bottleneck in plant science. While the genomic part has been developing fast, and now we can sequence entire genomes in few days, in few hundreds of dollars, they have a lot of information on genetics, to, to correlate gene function to phenotype is, is a slow step, is a real bottleneck due to the problems that I highlighted before. That's why since 10 years, there is a field of technology which is developing fast, which is called plant phenomics, which is the development of technology to study the way of making high throughput phenotyping implants. And, is what we call the, the, the start of this plant phenomics era. And we start so suddenly realize that it's important to have the use of images, remote sensors. So images are the key to go to high throughput. And this is because the, the, tech, the sensors became very cheap in the last years, so, so we can approach the agricultural science, which is, as you know, less rich than, than human health science. And this is very important. And imaging is also very, very well known in other biological science. We use imaging, for example, in healthcare to make the diagnosis by using very fancy equipment, so X-rays, 
CT, <laughs> computer tomograph, tom, tom, uh, tomatography, and also magnetic resonance uh, uh, is well known in healthcare. Uh, and so this is a transposition of imaging in other field of biology to plants. And if you use image, then you realize that you can, you can easily automate the whole process. I will show some example later on. And you then on images, you can use computer vision. You have very well powerful technology and informatics now well and informatic engineer do know that well. This, 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 this field of interest and, and also you can then apply bioinformatics and artificial intelligence to dig into the data. So all these pieces are well developed. And the other aspect that you can do by using images, you can integrate imaging with IoT, so Internet of Things, which means that you can integrate sensors on images with sensor on environmental condition, on soil, for example, mm -hmm. on air conditions yeah. are very well now. Sorry, I have to tell you that you have to also to, some of you have the microphone open and we have some returns. So if you please mute your microphones, we'll be fine. Sorry for that. And the other thing, which is a very jump, a very jump forward, a very lean forward is that uh, is non-destructive. Of course, if you take images on plants, you don't need to take samples out of the plants. You just take images with a proximal sensor and you can extract the features and characteristics from images. And you can also make dynamic. So you can go back on the same plants a different day in different time scale. And so you look for dynamic, you look for dynamic of your developments. And for that, imaging on plants is statistically robust. You don't sample, you don't have to extrapolate on the population. So that's very important. And now let's talk a little bit about sensors. This is a well-known piece of science and technology uh, and biologist knows that and physics in physics is very well known when if you put a biological organism or a biological tissues in a field of electromagnetic field then you have an interaction between the electromagnetic waves and, 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 your, and your organic uh, matter in your, in your organism. And with that, you can have a lot of sensors that detect what is happening. And you have, on, on, on the right, you can see better that, that you have, you have three, uh, you see here, if you see the, the pointer here, you have three different different uh, uh, effects that you can measure. You have the transmission, so what is passing through the organism. You have the absorption, you have that part of energy which is absorbed by the organism, and you have the reflection, which is part of the energy which is reflected towards the observer. If we, if we concentrate for a while on in the visible spectrum of the electromagnetic uh, field, which goes in a specific wavelength, which is well known because our eyes is a sensor for images in that particular particular field. Then, then you, you see that uh, plants have specific characteristics that are make them also unique respect compared to the uh, animal organism, in which plants have pigments. It's well known that plants have pigments. And they are color, they are colorful, they have plenty of colors and they enjoy our life with colors. But a part of enjoying, this is a very important aspect because we can use the light in the visible light to study the response of plants to the environment because they change the metabolism, they change the pigmentation, we can detect easily that. One of the pigments you know is the chlorophyll which is responsible for the green part, you see this this little peak here is the exactly the absorption in the in the blue light, which means the green. Uh, then, of course, coming back to these to the sensors, of course, we can use visible cameras, which are the standard cameras that, that to take photographs. And these are the visible ones, but we have also sensor for part of the spectrum which we do not see with our naked eye. So we need specific sensor. Luckily, we have it. We have sensor for the near infrared, which is the area, this area here, 
of the of the, the spectrum in which we can you see we can detect the water inside the tissues we can detect also some biochemicals such, such as lignin cellulose and we have, we have also the imaging spectroscopy which is hyperspectral so we have several wavelengths and with this sensor we can have a lot of information about the reflection in a reflection mode which goes on morphometric, architectural, development, also physiological insight of the plant. It's like looking inside of the plant. So by just imaging, which is an outside sensor, we can have hints of what is happening inside the plant at the physiological and biochemical level. But imaging of plants, you can do imaging on multi-level, we say multi-scale. So we can, you can produce images on single organs of the plant. For example, here you have a leaf. You can produce images on the whole plant. You can produce images at field level. So looking at the canopy in a field and looking at the whole field. And here the same for the roots. So this means that you can approach phenotyping in science to make study on, on, on single plant, but also you can use you can use also images to phenotype the plants in open field, which are good for breeding, but also good for smart farming applications. This is very important, I have to say, because plant phenotyping, high throughput plant phenotyping is not only for science, it's also the base for application in smart farming technology and in, in, in smart agriculture. That's a very important point I want to stress. Now some very few basic things about image analysis. Um, who of you is already computer science? They know about computer vision, but basically when oh, yeah, you have yeah, images, yeah. you have to apply algorithms, mm -hmm. programs that extract <coughs> from the image the features that you want, what we call traits. So the first thing is that to calibrate the image, the, we say the segment the image, which means distinguish the plant from the background, just extracting. And then on that, you have to extract the features. The feature can be the length of the leaf. The feature can be the height of the plant. The feature can be the tassel of a wheat plant, whatever you, mean, you want. And you can extract that by applying very fancy now algorithms which are in the field of artificial intelligence, which are deep learning, machine learning. So you can really do a lot of work by just automating the process by applying this kind of algorithms, which are very important. And you have, can have several configurations of, of platforms, we call them, of technology. One is that platforms for high resolution, which we call need high throughput phenomics. Usually they are in greenhouses, in control conditions, and they use sensors which can move to the plant or the plant can move to the sensor. And then you can detect images at several wavelengths or in several spectrum. And then the other thing is that nowadays we have also phenotyping platform in open field, not only in glass houses. So we can apply sensor in open field, and you can use in open field fixed sensors, mobile sensor, or also drones. So a man area vehicles that are loaded with sensor that can fly over the field that can take images of it, uh, of, of the field. And then you have also the more informatic part, which is important. You need modeling. And you need also to have an, e an informatic infrastructure because you have to deal with big data. You have to have databases. You have to have also data management, appropriate data management, appropriate data analysis, pipeline infrastructure. And now I, I'm introducing you the plant phenomenon platform that we have in Metaponto. This belongs to the high throughput phenotyping and it is, is located in our research center. It is inside a glass house is in semi-control conditions. And this is the way it looks like. So it has several sections. We have a conveyor system, which is the automated system in which we can manage the agronomical part. As you can see here, we can, we can uh, host roughly 500 pots. 
and we, uh, each pod is 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 within a card, a specific card, which has an electronic tag. So each plant is tagged electronically, is, is identified by the system. Then you can shuffle, you can mix them, you can also host several types of experiments with several plants. The only limitation we have is the 500 numbers and the height. I will tell you that of the plant that cannot be over 160 centimeters. And we have also then the imaging station. Again, these are the station in which images are taken. They host the sensors. And we have one for fluorescence, for photosynthesis, for stress. The other one is for near for the near infrared. Sorry, there is some there is there is some there is some noise. Some of you has the has to mute the microphone. I don't know who is. And then we have also the RGB, the indivisible light sensor, so three different chambers. But also we have a specific sensor for roots. This is very important. We'll come to that later on, which we can study the roots into the soil and look at morphology and activity of the roots. And by the way, as, as I mentioned before, we need to have computer and the center for elaboration of data. So we have it's an informatic part with servers and NAS with enough space for images and so on and so on. Now I will go into some example of what is, can be the use of high throughput plant phenotyping to study a specific response which is related to climatic changes. And this is the drought. And this, as you probably are aware of, drought is not a problem of the future. It's an urgent problem. It's a very compelling problem. And if you look here, this is Italy from 1997 to 2018. The red part is the moisture abnormalities that have been measured along the year. So let's say that rain less, so we had drought. And you can observe two things that, of course, we experience drought frequently, but in the last years, we are experiencing drought, drought much more. And this is due to the climatic changes. If you look at the Italy, of course, the situation is not homogeneous. You have hot spots, but the whole Italian peninsula is interested by drought. And this is particularly heavy in some part of the north, in the center of Italy, and also in the south. As you can see, here is the place where we are located right now in, in, in Basilicata. And this is as an example in which two years ago, even Rome had a, lot, had a lot of problems for potable water because the Bracciano Lake had much, something like 40% of the reservoir capacity. So what, they had problems also in delivering water in Rome, which is the capital city. So water and drought is a problem. And this is the last data. You, you see here that in 2017, for example, we have six artificial reservoirs in Basilicata, which are very important for agriculture, and also for potable water. And we had one sixth of the total capacity. And, and nowadays we have also in the same condition to, today in 2020. So it's very critical. And so the management of water is critical, but also using less water in agriculture is indeed critical. So how to tackle water scarcity within a phenotype space context? As I mentioned before, we have this two dimension in the phenotype space, which is the interaction between the genotype. So we can, of course, work on genotypes. We can make breeding on plants. We can improve the resilience of plants to, to drought. We can improve the water use efficiency of plants by using genetics. And we can use mutants, natural variants, et cetera. But then it comes with interaction with the environment. But we can do nothing to control the environment at farm level. Of course, we can help in, 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 in reducing climate change, but we cannot control the environment in open field. But we can extract one third dimension from the environment, which is the management of agronomical practices. 
So we can improve indeed agronomical practices to help plants better cope with drought. So in, 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 uh, we can work on these two dimensions with science and innovation in order to improve it. And so I will make some examples on these two. But I want also to highlight to you the importance of, of management, which, which is underestimated. As you see, this is a file which stated that to cope with drought, further genetic enhancement contribute in the medium and long term. But on farm best management practices, will provide more immediate and effective way to increase crop water productivity. So this means that to, you can look at medium and long term to improve crops, but to help now, it's much better to work on, on water management in, on farm, at farm level. That's why it's very important, as it's quite underestimated. So how some example of traits that can be extracted, very simple ones. I will not be, be, be tired you with, uh, with, with very fancy examples. So I will take some very, very, very few examples. One is looking into the visible light. And so looking at morphometric architectural parameters of plants, what also we can appreciate by our eyes. And you can see here the images that are taken by the platform. This is one on the top and two from the side. And with this, you can transform the, your images. You can extract some information, as I, as I say. As you can see here, there's a, bit, or a segmentation. So the, the plants has been uh, distinguished by the background. And then you can work on the pixels with computer vision. And so you can extract, for example, data on biomass, on bio volumes, on the biomass spatial distribution, so not only a medium ever on the whole plant, but also the distribution in, along the plant. On compactness, for example, or some color indexes. These are important, for example, for pathogen attack for diseases, because often the plant change colors when they are attacked by pathogens, and also health indexes. So the digital biomass is quite uh, straightforward. You can use uh, three pictures which reconstruct a kind of 3D model of your plant. And then you can apply some models like this one here, and you can estimate your digital what your biomass, which is related to the, the fresh weight of the plant. And another index that you can take is the compactness of the plants, which can, talk, can tell you about the distribution of the green tissue of the leaves around the very center of the plant. And you can take this from the top, you can take this from the side. And I will now go into this, so how to use these traits to compare, for example, genotypes or treatment effects. And this is, for example, the, the comparison between two genotypes. On top, you have a control line, which is, let's say, a normal tomato plants. And here you have a tomato, a tomato line, which is tolerant to drought. You also can appreciate by eyes that they have a different also architecture that can, you can measure by compactness. And if you translate these pictures, these qualitative elements into numbers by using computer vision, then you have here a plot in which you can distinguish the compactness of your normal plant and your resistant plants. So the two plants are not only, not only they are different in, in genotypes, so they have also different behaviors in the architecture, which reflects into the behavior of the plant for drought tolerance. And if you compare then, for example, here is another example in which you compare control plants versus stress. You can hear a, seri a time series of plants which have been grown normally, and this is stress condition you see the plants try to dry out and wilt at the end and so this reflects of course in the compactness this index of the plant and you can measure again you can distinguish by imaging analysis between drought and well water plant but one of the nice things which you can do with the with this imaging is that you can dig out 
traits. Working on a hidden part of the plants, which is roots. Roots has always been neglected by science because it's very difficult to study. But nowadays with this technology, you can study plants. And you can take images in a specific setup and, and look at, at how the, the, you see here in the cartoon, how, how the, the root grows. You can then distinguish roots into the soil and then you can extract segments by imaging and you could really just by let's say counting saying say the same in the simple way the the pixel of the roots you can you can then estimate the root biomass and given that then you can make a time series so for, for example on genotypes here and you can see the different genotypes with different colors behave differently in the development of roots a specific point along the soil profile. So you give you also insights in how the roots behave and how they are active across different genotypes, something that was very difficult to do before. But we can also use some other sensor to look at root activity, for example, they're using near infrared. I mentioned before that infrared, near infrared is useful to detect water content inside its specific wavelength. And you can look at water content in planta or in root soil. And here, for example, you have that different, if you dry out a plant, you don't just don't give water to the plant, you can pick up this by near infrared, and you can see that there is much less water into the tissue. So the kinetic is that the water inside is going down. And this is very nice application to study also drought tolerance in plants. But going what we can do for in farm management. So far I discussed about the genotypes, what the genotype look like, how the traits can pick up in genotypes can distinguish drought from non-drought or tolerance, drought tolerance from non-drought tolerance. But now you can use also the, these, uh, these platforms to study also how to apply, for example, biostimulants that can be useful for using this, this kind of uh, uh, instrument we have in our hand to cope with drought by using the same genetics. You know, in this case, you don't need to make genetic improvement, just use a biostimulant on the same variety, which was, let's say, uh, not, toler not tolerant to drought and making it cope better with drought. So this is like a cartoon in which, an animation in which shows a kind of experiment, just two, two plants for the sake of simplicity. On the left, you have the untreated, and on the right, you have the treated with biostimulant. You apply for the stress, then you can recover the plant, and you see that the plants behave differently from, from the treatment. And what you can see is that the biostimulant helped the plant to grow better, in a better shape, and it, it was, when you plot it, you, again, you see that the biostimulant make the plant with, that normally was, was sensitive to drought, make it like, like growing in normal conditions. So this makes a very, very, very important aspect because you can use better practices into the field in order to cope with some stresses that are already present. So this is very important. And so if you look also in the roots, if you see here with the colors, with the blue, the pale blue, yellow means that the roots are more active. The biostimulation also helps root in using better the water. So this is made from imaging with the near infrared sensors. You can have the biostimulation. Plants are able with the roots to uptake better and much more water from the soil. So this is another example in which you can use the imaging in order to understand how the plant cope with drought. Okay, and then I come to the conclusions. Uh, prime time, yes, I think. Uh, well, I hope that uh, I was, was able to convince that plants are indeed important and uh, that now we are in, uh, in an era that is very, very exciting for new fast and developed technology on plant phenomics. A technology which int integrates several disciplines, uh, several technologies, makes plant scientists, physiologists, engineers, informatics, physicists, to develop technologies that are useful for, uh, to increase their throughput in uh, of plant phenotyping. 
It is a technology that produces and analyzes big data, uses a lot of informatics with uh, computer vision and artificial intelligence approaches. So informatics is relevant. And for some of you from the Rookup people who works on informatics, this can be a nice way of also thinking that what, that what you can do is also important, can be important also in plant phenotyping field. And, and nevertheless, uh, I, I also explained that that phenotyping, high throughput phenotyping, speeds up plant breeding. Just to give you the idea that uh, one single plant can be imaged in, on our platform in two minutes, uh, and plant science discoveries. Uh, so this speeds up also on science and application side. But uh, this is the stress uh, I made before. Plant phenotyping is not only for science, because supports a smart farming development. If we, we can we apply high throughput phenotyping in the field, we can apply the same technology for smart farming applications. If we want, if we want to irrigate better in a field, we have now the technology to say that we can pick up the plant stress as, as soon as it appears in the field. And so you can irrigate the plant and the plants where it's, uh, it's needed. And also phenomics strongly contributes in finding plant phenotypes that are resilient to climatic changes in user stress, such as drought. And before I go to the really to the to thank you, I want to highlight a specific project which is in Europe, which is called EPPN 2020. Europe acknowledged this technology as very strategic, and and, and uh, we have now in Europe a project, a project, large project for strategic European research infrastructure, which is called Emphasis, which we are part of it, which puts together all the infrastructure that are present uh, in Europe and, uh, and our, our, our center is part of it. But there is another project, which is this EPPN 2020, which is uh, now coming to the last uh, two years. And this, this project puts together the network of the research infrastructure to harmonize the methods, but also to, and this is the message I want to convey to you, to, to allow scientists which are outside from Italy, for example, to have access to our platform and the project will be paid off completely by, the, by, by EPPN 2020. This means that if any of you is interested in making experiments in one platform of the, this network, you can apply. There will be an open call in June. It will, be, it will end in October 2020. And if you pass through the evaluation, then you can go into to the platform, run the experiments, and everything will be paid, including travels and, 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 and lodging expenses. And with this, I think I finish. I thank you for your attention. I will take some questions, if any. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Francesco, very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. So uh, is there... Are there any questions? Well, I would like to, uh, in the name of the Rookups project, of course, I would like to thank Francesco for uh, this nice talk on phenotyping. I mean, it's, it's super, super interesting the way how all the complexities in from agronomics and agriculture can be joined together by using technologies. Now, my, my, my question for Francesco is, because of course, this is the question that is coming around this online workshop for everybody. So I think that this is also a, a good time for doing the same. Considering this pandemic, this coronavirus uh, issue that are happening nowadays, uh, is, and also considering that it's, not, that it's not something unexpected, I would say, because we have a lot of um, you know, pandemics in the past, many outbreaks in the past, in the last 500 years, 300 years, 200 years, the, all the time in the world, something happens. But it seemed that this time was totally different, I would say, the, the world took it in a very different manner. So how do you see the, the challenge for the next 10 or 20 years in, from uh, agronomic, uh, dealing with all the phenotyping management uh, consider all this new challenge that is in addition to climate change, I would say. How do you see those challenges to come? Okay, first of all, let me say hello to you. It's a long time that we don't see each other by face. Yes, <laughs> we had to wait for this uh, remote. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this is a very good point, I think. But I think that there are two points that will stress that these technologies and plants will be still 
uh, actually will be more important as before. We already know that, uh, for example, in, in the whole urban house in Italy, the food has been one of the key strategic points to, to, to preserve from COVID. So we need to, you know, we need to produce. But what will change is that I think that will speed up much more farming because of social distancing. I think that the future will be much more on farmers that will use devices and technology instead of going to the field, you know, you can look at your field just by using sensors, imaging, satellite, imageries, use all of these to support farmers to cope better with production. This was already on the pipeline, but now I think it's much more stress, it will be more stress to really go fast on that. So that's why I think that uh, this piece of technology, like in, combined with what you guys are doing also with, with the uh, decision support systems, algorithms, all these kind of new services, let's say, would be much, much, much more used. I will, I will also stress the fact that also the robotics in the fields, I, 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 will, I did not mention nothing about the actuator in the field, but then the, all the robotics for the harvest to treat all the machines. So this, in other words, will of course, also change the way we, we work in the field. There will be many labor intensive work. Then you, you open a social of course issue there, but you know, I think that this pandemic is, is, is pushing up in that direction much, much stronger than before. Okay, thank you. Any other question? No. So thank you, Francesco, once again. And uh, I invite all the audience that, uh, that are not part of, of the Rukavs project to follow our online workshop, uh, and I, I put the, just the link in the chat. And now I invite you to also to, to follow Jorge's presentation. You, if you go on uh, the on, on Rukap's webpage, you can find the link and you can follow so other, uh, all other works. And uh, in, now at four, there will be Jorge presentation. So thank you very much for your attendance and um, bye. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye bye, Tati, grazie. Ciao. 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 Ciao, ciao. Ciao, Rina. Ciao, Francesco. Ciao, Mareva. Ciao. Ciao, <laughs> ciao Rina. Ciao, Francesco. Ciao. Ciao, Anco. Ciao. 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 ciao.